There are moments in world history which are moments of fundamental change. Hay momentos en la historia internacional que son momentos de cambio decisivo. We are currently living in just such a moment. Vivimos actualmente precisamente en uno de esos momentos. And it always occurs that in such times, people tend to look for historical parallels and analogies. You know, it's like 1929, or it's the, like the Great Depression, or it's like the uh, 1917, or whatever. Siempre se tiende a decir, bueno, esto es como en 1929, esto es como la Gran Depresión, esto es como 1917. We feel a kind of psychological comfort when we establish such parallels. Sentimos una especie de comodidad mental cuando establecemos esos paralelos. We feel that we are somehow standing on solid ground. Parece que nos sentimos como que estamos andando sobre terreno sólido. Unfortunately, now we are not uh, standing on solid grounds at all. Pero, ahora no nos en, en Because there's absolutely nothing in, in, in history of the last centuries that, that bear, bears the slightest resemblance to the situation which we now face on a world scale. The Bank of England recently said that this was the uh, uh, the deepest crisis uh, for the last 300 years. I mean, that's saying quite a lot, three centuries, quite a long time, you would think. But even this, but even this is, is an insufficient uh, parallel. If you're going to look for a, a serious historical parallel to the present situation, you would have to go back, in my opinion, to the 14th century, to the, to the Black Death, which killed nearly half the population of Europe. You know, people then, people then uh, must have believed that they were living through a nightmare. It was a nightmare. And uh, many people actually fervently believed that the end of, end of the world had come. The end of, end of the world was approaching. They believed this. Now, in historical retrospect, we can say that it was not the end of the world that was approaching. It was the demise of a particular socio-economic system called feudalism. And actually, the, the, the Black Death, you may not realize this, the Black Death actually played a material role in hastening this pro process. That's perfectly true. So we can say that there's a certain parallel there, I would think. Although it's true to say, of course, that we've not yet, uh, not yet at least, approached numbers uh, of people killed that, that approach these frightful figures of the Black Death, that's true. But the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic, it, it exceeds the Black Death to start with by its colossal uh, uh, global reach. And actually, nobody knows how many people have died of this terrible disease so far. The, the, the governments systematically lie and conceal the figures and distort the figures.
but uh, we can be certain that the, 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 the figures of deaths will, will reach more than a million by the end of the year. That's absolutely certain. And the pandemic is still raging out of control, especially in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. But also in the United States, which after all is the richest country in the world. Now it is important to point out one thing which is generally not understood. The coronavirus uh, pandemic is not the cause of the present economic crisis. La pandemia del coronavirus no es la causa de la crisis económica actual. Although it has undoubtedly complicated the whole situation and, and enormously deepened the crisis, well, that's correct. Aunque sí que hay que decir que la ha complicado y la ha profundizado la crisis existente. But the capitalist system, if you look at the figures, was already in a state of crisis before this disease took a grip. Pero si miramos las cifras económicas, podemos ver que el sistema capitalista ya se encontraba en crisis antes de que esta, surgiese esta pandemia. The slowdown in China was already existing well before this. La desaceleración que tuvo lugar en China ya había empezado mucho antes del coronavirus. And in general, there was a decrease in all kinds of economic indices that was quite plain. Y había un, de, un, un descenso de todos los índices económicos. The trade, the trade war between China and America already existed and was getting worse. So capitalism was already heading towards a, a, a crisis, a serious crisis, well before this. But of course, the, the, the pandemic now adds to this in a very important way. Dialectically speaking, cause becomes effect and effect becomes cause. And that's what you see. An enormous downward spiral now is taking place, which they can't control. And this situation, as I say, is quite unique in history. You will not find anything like this ever. The first difference with the past, which I would emphasize, is the enormous, the breathtaking speed of events, the breathtaking speed of the economic collapse, for example. After the Wall Street, uh, Wall Street economic uh, financial crash of 1929, it took several years for mass employment to really take, take a hold in the United States. Llevó varios años para que el desempleo empezara a desarrollarse de manera grave en los Estados Unidos. Now it took only 15 days for the U.S. stock market to fall by 20%, which is the fastest decline ever seen in history. Ahora solo eh, eh, necesitó 15 días, o sea, pasaron 15 días para que el mercado de valores de los Estados Unidos cayera un 20%. And with a matter of, 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 of months or even weeks, uh, unemployment in the USA already reached the figure, the astonishing figure of 40 million, 40 million people unemployed in the United States. And this situation has taken the, the strategies of capital, starting with the bourgeois economies, completely by surprise. They're stunned. Esto 
the economists have shown a complete, yet again, yet again, not the first time or the second time, yet again, they've shown the complete, a complete inability to understand what is occurring, let alone provide a solution to the crisis. The economic forecast, so-called, of the uh, International Monetary, Monetary Fund and the World Bank are completely useless because for the simple reason that nobody can predict the outcome of the present uh, coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. Los pronósticos económicos del Fondo Monetario Internacional y del Banco Mundial son totalmente inútiles, ya que nadie puede predecir las consecuencias de la pandemia actual del coronavirus. The only thing which we can predict with absolute confidence is the situation will go from bad to worse. That is certain. Solo podemos predecir que la situación va a ir de mal en peor. In 1938, uh, the great Marxist Leon Trotsky Refer, uh, referred to the ruling class of the world, and I quote, tobogganing to disaster with, the, with their eyes closed. And this is precisely the position we see at the present time. In 1938, the great revolutionary Leon Trotsky se refirió a la clase dominante del mundo como que se estaba deslizando hacia el desastre con los ojos cerrados. Y eso es precisamente lo que tenemos hoy en día. And this is something different. If you think about it, this is something quite different. It's a different situation now. Y pensadlo, esto es una situación. Ten minutes gone, Alan. In the past, in, 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 even in moments of deep crisis, such as economic crisis, slumps or wars, people felt at least, they felt that the government, if it didn't exactly control the situation, well, at least it had some kind of a plan to get out of the crisis. In the past, even in moments of crisis, profound, of war, etc., people felt that the government, if not exactly in control of the situation, at least there was some kind of a plan to get out of the crisis. Now, today, that's evidently not the case. Now, today, that's evidently not the case. You know, there is, there's an old saying, I don't know whether it's in English anyway, I don't know if it exists in other languages. But the people, people get the government which it deserves. Now that, that is not actually correct. But what is perfectly true is that at the present time, the, the, the ruling class of the world has got the government that, that it deserves most definitely. We have the Holy Trinity or the unholy Trinity, I should say, of uh, Donald Trump in the USA, Boris Johnson in Britain and Bolsonaro in Brazil. What do these people represent? They represent their personification of the complete intellectual and moral bankruptcy of the bourgeoisie in, in the stage of its senile decay. That's what they represent representan la personificación de la bancarrota intelectual y moral de la burguesía en esta etapa de decadencia senil. Es un cuadro muy pesimista al que se enfrenta la burguesía. Es un cuadro muy pesimista al que se enfrenta la burguesía. Pero en order to console themselves somehow, the economists are now predicting that uh, don't don't worry because after this crisis is over, there's going to be a a powerful recovery, a rebound, they say. Pero ahora, para consolarse a sí mismos, los economistas están prediciendo una recuperación muy poderosa una vez que pase esta pandemia. This is a complete illusion. It's a dream. Pero eso es una pura ilusión, un sueño. You see, let, let's look at the facts. Miremos a los, los hechos. In order to prevent an immediate collapse of the capitalist system, Governments have poured trillions of dollars into the economy just to keep it alive. Para evitar un colapso inmediato del sistema capitalista, 
los gobiernos no han reparado en gastos para invertir en, en o sea, para en, en producir en la economía. And this, is, this, of course, it, it has succeeded. We, we have to admit it has succeeded in preventing an immediate uh, collapse. Yes, but at what cost? Estos billones de, en, 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 en inyectados a la economía sí que han tenido un efecto, pero ¿a qué coste? And what are the costs for the future? ¿Y cuál es el coste para el futuro? The effect of this is quite clear. They're piling up a mountain of debt, and debts, believe it or not, sooner or later must be paid que ha tenido es el de acumular una montaña de, de, de deuda y las deudas, como se sabe, más pronto o más tarde tienen que ser pagadas. Yes, and the question is very simple. Who is going to pay? Y la cuestión, la pregunta es sencilla. ¿Quién va a pagarla? That's the question nobody wants to ask, but it is the fundamental question. Esa es la pregunta que nadie quiere hacerse. By the way, it's the same question to draw an historical analogy. Y, y mucho menos contestarla. This was the same question that, that started the French Revolution and the English Revolution. Huge public debts and the question arose, who was going to pay when the nobility and the clergy refused to pay? The fat cats refused to pay then, and they'll refuse to be sure that they'll, they'll refuse to pay now also. And that started the revolution, both in uh, Britain, in England and in France. It is quite clear what's going to happen. The full weight of the, of the crisis will be placed, placed on the shoulders of those least able to pay. The poor, the old, the sick, los pobres, los viejos, los enfermos, the unemployed, los desempleados, the working class, in other words, and the middle class also will be hit. And this is a finished recipe for class struggle, for revolutionary class struggle, in all countries, in every country in the world without exception. That's the real perspective. It is a perspective of world revolution, yes. You think I'm exaggerating? Well, let me call, let me call the, a witness for the defense. The more thinking representatives of the ruling class are already coming to the same conclusion as the Marxists. I could give many examples, let's just quote one for lack of time. Please write this down. A couple of months ago, the Financial Times wrote the following, and I quote. A return to austerity would be madness. An invitation to widespread social unrest. If not revolution. I repeat, if not revolution, they're clear on this. And a godsend for the populace, a present for the populists. Populist is the word they use for anyone they don't like. In other words, the serious representatives of capital understand that revolution is implicit in the whole situation. And they are not mistaken. Karl Marx said, social being determines consciousness. That's what he said. And what we see now is very interesting. It's lightening the speed of change of consciousness. 
cambios eh, repentinos en la situación. This applies to all classes in society, by the way, starting at the top. Y esto es aplicable a todas las clases sociales empezando por arriba. Crisis of the bourgeois, black pessimism of the strategies of capital. Pessimism also of the petty bourgeoisie. Expressed in that uh, other pandemic. Which has a terrible effect in the universities, which has killed uh, every single university in the world. A terrible disease has got no, no vaccine, it will ever be found for this. It's called postmodernism. But we leave that to one side. I think it will be dealt with in other sessions of this school. But for the Marxists, of course, the most important change of consciousness is the con consciousness of the working class. One, two minutes gone. And this, of course, does not proceed in a straight line. For a long time, it lags behind uh, the, the objective situation that we know. But sooner or later, it catches up and it catches up with the bang. And that's precisely what a revolution is. We see that taking place now, at least the beginnings of it. Everywhere you look, you see a growing discontent, anger, fury and hatred of the existing order. Everywhere you look. Yeah, all, when I say all countries, I mean all countries. And we have a very striking example taking place right now. With events on the, the mass demonstrations taking place on the streets of Israel of all countries. But of course, the most graphic expression is the, the movement that took place uh, and is still taking place <clears throat> in the United States of America. And it seems as if this movement came from nowhere, like, 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 a, like a, a, a thunderbolt from a clear blue sky. But this movement did not come from nowhere. As they say, nothing comes from nothing. It was the result of decades and generations of exploitation, oppression, poverty, bad housing, racism, police violence, and so on. It is sparked off, as you know, by the brutal police murder of George Floyd. But that's an explanation which explains nothing. There were many uh, murders like that who took place over many decades without provoking any similar protests. But dialectics teaches us at a certain point that quantity becomes transformed into quality. For millions of poor people in the USA, the murder of George Floyd was the straw that broke the camel's back, the tipping point, if you like to use that expression. And what's absolutely amazing about the situation in, in, America, in the United States is the lightning speed with which un events unfolded. There, there was an immediate uh, eruption, an immediate reaction. In Minneapolis, for example, where the, where the whole thing started. 
The police were forced to flee from a crowd of angry demonstrators who proceeded to burn down the precinct, the police station. I don't believe there's been anything remotely like that on that scale in the whole of recent American history. I don't think so. And it was, it, it, it was almost as if there was a giant invisible hand which suddenly moved uh, similar demonstrations all over America, simultaneously practically. Now listen, this is a, a concrete uh, proof of dialectics in, in action. Esta es la prueba en la práctica de la dialéctica. It, and it is the final answer to all those wretched skeptics, pessimists and cowards and renegades that are too many of them, who argued that the, that the working class would never move, at least of all, of course, in the United States. Yes, la respuesta final a todos esos escépticos y cobardes que argumentan que la clase obrera nunca va a movilizarse y mucho menos en los Estados Unidos. We have the spectacle of the most powerful man in the world, Donald Trump, tenemos el espectáculo de que el hombre más poderoso del mundo cowering in the cellars of the White House I mean, out, out of fear of the demonstrators, he thought he would they, they, he thought they would break in, break into his uh, his hidey hole. Now he thinks he can control the movement by sending in the troops. Despite the fact that all his advisors, including the Pentagon, have, have warned against this. Sí, just look at what's happening right now on the streets of Portland. Violent demonstrations, violent clashes with the police. It's almost like civil war on the streets. You know, sometimes I think that we should send a a telegram of, of, of congratulations to the to Donald Trump. Algunas veces se me pasa por la cabeza enviarle que deberíamos de enviar un telegrama a, Dona, a Donald Trump. And thank him very sincerely for doing our work for us so effectively. Y agradecerle muy sinceramente eh, que nos está a, a, ayudando en nuestro trabajo. Yeah. To put your minds at rest, that's just a joke, by the way. Para que <laughs> quedéis tranquilos, esto solamente es una broma. But it remains a fact that Donald Trump now, whether he likes it or not, is unconsciously serving as an agent promoting revolution very effectively in the United States. Now we don't, we should not exaggerate, we should never exaggerate uh, comments. We must adopt, we must adopt, a, 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 always keep a cool head. If you ask me, is there a revolution in the United States today? I answer, no, of course, there's not a revolution. But if you ask me uh, if, if, if something fundamental is changing in the USA, I answer emphatically, yes. Oh, yes. This is a turning point. Turning point in the history of the USA, turning point in world history. Because the USA, my friends, is not just any country, is it? It's a key country in the world. And what do these events in, in, in the USA, what do they show? I'll tell you what. It shows the enormous power of the working class once it starts to move. Power of the masses, if you like. Because it's not just the workers, many sections are involved. By the way, by the way, not just blacks, but whites as well. And what this shows, what this shows us 
is that there is a power in society which is more powerful than the strongest state, army, or police force. And by the way, there are serious splits in the ruling class as a result of this, serious splits, even, even, even with the army, the splits. And Lenin explained that splits in the ruling class is the first condition for a revolution, actually. That's, that is quite true, but there is a problem here. Not just in the USA, but it's a general problem. And it's a central theme which is occupied the minds of every, every communist that attends this school today. On the one hand, you see the tremendous power of the spontaneous movement of the masses. That's perfectly true. And that's the prior condition for, for, for all revolutions, actually, the movement of the masses. Yes, but, yes, but. In and of itself, the spontaneous movement of the masses is not sufficient to guarantee the success of a revolution. Never, never sufficient. Este movimiento espontáneo de las masas nunca es suficiente para garantizar el éxito. What is required is an organization. Lo que se necesita es una organización. And a leadership that is capable of showing the way forward. Y una dirección que es capaz de mostrar el camino adelante. And unfortunately, that is precisely what is lacking. Y eso es lo que, lo que, lo que in the USA, in, in uh, Israel. In Britain, in France, whatever you look, it's the same, same story. In India and so on, of course. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the crisis is a, a, a deep global crisis. It affects every country in the world. Let's take China as an example. Until recently, China was one of the main motor forces driving the world economy in the last period. 30 minutes gone. But dialectically, things turn into their opposite. China is no longer seen as part of the solution. It's a big part of the problem. China has built up a formidable industry with a large productive capacity. Yes, but the internal demand in China, China is not sufficient to absorb this colossal product, productive capacity. China must export to survive. But its success in the field of exports, for example, companies like Huawei, have provoked a furious response, particularly from the USA. Where, where Trump is pursuing his policy of America first. His slogan is, let's make America great again. He forgot to add the second part of the sentence. At the expense of the rest of the world. Now he's import, imposed severe tariffs against China, against Huawei. Yes, but he's also at, at war in that sense with Europe. And economic nationalism now, that's the name of the game. That's the predominant tendency now. 
The trade war between the US here and China is a, is a symptom of this phenomenon. And this protectionism, this protectionism threatens the whole delicate, fragile fabric of, of world trade that was painfully put together in the decades following the Second World War. This threatens the capitalist system with a complete catastrophe. A deep slump, far, far more serious than the depression of the 1930s. That's the real perspective. The consequences of, the, of this, of course, is very serious for, for all countries, even the so-called richer countries. But for the poor countries of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, it spells an absolute uh, nightmare. Lenin once said that capitalism is horror without end. The truth of that statement was, was recently uh, demonstrated by a statement issued by the World, World Health Organization. Which uh, warned that over 600, uh, big pardon, 265 million people were threatened with death by starvation by the end of this year. And that is uh, undoubtedly true. That's the reality of our world in 2020. The pandemic, of course, has the most terrible effects in these countries. Latin America is now one of the focal points. It's rapidly spreading in Africa. And in India also, but there's a terrible situation. In India, out of a workforce of 471 million, only 19% are covered with the social security. Two thirds have no formal employment. And at least 100 million are migrant workers. And this uh, ferocious reactionary Modi, tries to solve the, 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 the pandemic by expelling millions of poor people living on the streets of Delhi, Mumbai and other cities. Sending them home to their native villages and therefore spreading the pandemic to places which are least able to resist it. Nobody knows how many people have died in India, but the real figure will be absolutely horrendous. There's been nothing like this since the partition of uh, 1947. And in general, you see the, the, the stinking hypocrisy of the bourgeois so-called experts. They have, a very, they have a very simple solution, of course. Maintain social distancing. Wash your hands regularly. 
wash your hands regularly in countries where sometimes 250 people share a single water tap. And how do you maintain social distancing in the slums of Rio de Janeiro or Mumbai or Karachi or any of those places, townships in South Africa and so on? It's, 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 it's impossible. And therefore, the entire situation is absolutely uh, impossible. It's impossible for the masses to live. Let us put it very simply. In order for the people to live, the capitalist system must die. And the masses are prepared to fight. They've shown this in one country after another. They are showing it in one country after another. But the problem is one of leadership, comrades. It's, a problem. it's a very simple question. Sometimes people say, the clever people say to me, oh, you're very simplistic. There's a simplistic solution. You can't reduce everything to leadership. <laughs> well, I am a very simple man. I like simple ideas and simple solutions. And I, be, I believe it's correct what Trotsky said in 1938, where he wrote that you could reduce the uh, crisis of humanity can be reduced in the last analysis to a, to a crisis of the leadership of the, of the proletariat. That's the, that's the fact. And you see the complete bankruptcy now of all tendencies of reformism, including the former Stalinists, who are the worst kind of, uh, of, of reformists and traitors. These ladies and gentlemen for generations have, have, have controlled the masses in, in different, in India in particular, I'm thinking, but in other countries also, in Italy, France, they, they, they were in control. In Britain also, the Labour Party so it still is control, in control. Okay. But I've got news for the reformists. The crisis of capitalism is also inevitably your crisis, the crisis of reformism. Everywhere you see the same tendency. The masses are desperately seeking a way out of this crisis, of course. And therefore, in this search for a way out, they will turn to all kinds of options. One of the features of this situation, you can see this quite clearly. And we must be prepared for this. We must understand what it means. Is violent swings on the electoral plane to the left and to the right. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's an expression of people's attempts to find a way out of the crisis. You can't blame them for that. But all political tendencies and leaders are going to be put to the test. And that especially applies to the reformists, both the left and the right varieties. The left reformists in particular have shown complete bankruptcy. Sometimes under pressure of the masses, they can adopt a very left-sounding demagogy rhetoric. 
pueden we must not be deceived by this although we'll, we'll give them yes we'll give them critical support against the right wing that goes without saying but we must, but we must keep a level head and, and what you must understand is that these guys they have something in common they've got a lot in common with the right reformists both of them, neither of them, shall we say, have any perspective of abolishing capitalism. They believe that capitalism can be reformed and made more humane, more, you know, capitalism with a human face and so on. <laughs> yes. And they, these guys have got the, 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 the cheek, the impudence to accuse us of being utopians. <laughs> My dear friends, the Marxists are the only realistic tendency in the world. The only tendency that looks facts in the face and tells the truth. The reformists, particularly the lefts, actually, have got the, they, they, they fool themselves and they try to fool others. But these illusions will be cruelly exposed by the course of events. As we already saw in the case of Tsipras in Greece, or I might add even the case of Jeremy Corbyn in Britain and Sanders in the USA. Now, if you look at the, uh, the, the world situation, if it, just, just look at it through the eyes of an ordinary person who is not a Marxist. And what do you see? Everywhere you see a, a picture of unmitigated horror, mass unemployment, hunger, starvation, disease, wars, suffering, disease and death. And people who lack a, a scientific Marxist understanding of history could be excused for drawing pessimistic conclusions, and most people do draw pessimistic conclusions. But you see, what we are seeing here are symptoms. Symptoms. They are merely the, the external manifestations of an under, underlying disease. I was no good whatsoever weeping and wailing and complaining about the symptoms. Imagine if you go to the doctor with particular symptoms, you don't expect a doctor to, a doctor to pull out a handkerchief and start weeping. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't be much of a doctor, would he? And like a good doctor, we must be capable of analyzing the symptoms in order to explain the underlying cause. And here I believe, yes, you could look for historical parallels, I think so. We've seen, this, seen the same symptoms before. For example, in the decline of the Roman Empire, which took place over a period of some centuries, two or three centuries, and was accompanied by the most frightful economic, social, moral, and philosophical degeneration. Oh, yes. 
Incidentally, that long period of decline did not proceed in a straight line. It never does, you know. It never does. Ese largo periodo de declive no ocurrió de una, en, en forma de línea recta. Nunca es así. There were periods of recovery. Hubo periodos de recuperación. Just as a dying man sometimes will display the symptoms of recovery, which are merely the prelude to a further and irrevocable collapse. De igual manera que un hombre eh, muriendo, algunas veces parece que repentinamente tiene, eh, expresa síntomas de recuperación, pero estos son meramente el preludio para un colapso posterior y de forma irrevocable. Like slave society in the past. Como la sistema, eh, esclavista en el pasado. Like feudalism also. Como el feudalismo también. The capitalist system now has reached a point of irreversible decline. It, is, uh, it has outlived its historical role. It's no longer capable of, of anything resembling progress. 15 minutes gone. That's why, by the way, the postmodernists deny the existence of progress in general. <laughs> yes, they're incapable of understanding that capitalism is incapable of progress. That's what they don't understand. And therefore, they denied the existence of progress in general, which is a childish assumption to make. And in the state, the state of its senile decay, capitalism presents a serious threat, not just to civilization, but even to the, the existence of the human race itself. It is poisoning the air we breathe, the water we drink, the seas and the oceans, and therefore they, they are placing in jeopardy the future of, uh, of life on Earth, as a matter of fact. Yes, it's a frightening picture. It's a frightening picture. <clears throat> and one can understand the pessimism of the middle class uh, people and so complain about this or that, the Greens and so on. But these people are all pessimistic, you know, completely pessimistic. Because they, they don't understand, they can't see beyond the symptoms. They don't understand that beneath the symptoms, the frightful symptoms of terminal decay, a new world is struggling to be born. And it is our duty, the duty of revolutionaries, to do what? To make this death agony of capitalism as short as possible. To bring about the birth of a new system, a new world. And therefore, to assist the birth in such a way that it occurs as soon as possible and with as little pain and suffering as possible. You see, the comrades, the, the facts, the facts speak for themselves, really. It doesn't, it doesn't need much explanation on my part. The capitalist system, if you like, is on life support. It's in a ventilator. It depends on oxygen. In the form of what? 
of trillions of, of dollars handed over of public money of the state. Yes, but just a minute, please. Just a minute. According to all the theories of the bourgeois economists, of market economics, the state is not supposed to play any role whatsoever in economic life. That was the, 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 the slogan, wasn't it, of all these economists, Hayek and all the other gang. Particularly after the fall of the Soviet Union, which allegedly showed the, the, the death of socialism, according to them. The end of history, according to Francis Fukuyama. Although I note that Mr. Fukuyama has changed his tune now. He says, no, it's not the end of history at all. And capitalism is now in crisis. Well, well. Thank you very much, Mr. Fukuyama. See, the question is very concrete, isn't it? It's very concrete and very simple. If the capitalist system cannot survive unless it's cropped up on the crutches of the state, why not abolish it altogether and let the state take complete control of the economy to save it from falling into complete and absolute bankruptcy? And why do the working class not take control of the state if it comes to that and take over the, from the hands of these corrupt, uh, useless bureaucrats which, which control it now? Now, part of this school, I think a big part of it, will be directed against this uh, wretched nonsense of postmodernism. Which uh, maintain that you, that you can't understand history, there are no laws to history, so no logic at all. It's merely a series of accidents, that's all. An idea, a, a, a mystical idea, which we reject totally. <laughs> By the way, it doesn't even make logical sense. It seems that the whole universe is governed by laws. From the biggest galaxies to the smallest sub subatomic particle. According to them, the only thing which is not governed by, by laws is ourselves. A child of six could see that that's an absurd statement to make. No, no, history has its own laws, which is our duty to understand. Without such an understanding, we will never rise to the, the level demanded by history. History does have a causality. History does have its own laws, its own causality. And in that sense, we, yes, we are historical determinists. Oh, yes, we are historical determinists. In the sense that we understand that the general processes of history function according to definite laws. But sometimes there's some confusion over this. So let me explain. Determinism is not at all the same thing as fatalism. It's totally different. 
Marx explained many times that men and women make their own history. You see, but uh, never, uh, nevertheless, whether a source, uh, whether, a, uh, shall we say, when a, a given social, socioeconomic system enters a stage of decline, the objective conditions for social revolution are placed on the order of the day. That is clear. But whether that revolution will succeed or fail is not an automatic question. It depends on the active involvement of the subjective factor. In other words, the revolutionary party and its leadership. Now, some of you might know that I've been working on the English Revolution. I'm producing a book. I've done a series of pod podcasts about it. 60 minutes gone. It's a very interesting question. And in the 17th century, that revolution, the, the first bourgeois revolution, if you exclude Holland, was fought out under the banner of religion, although fundamentally it was a class question, as I have explained. The Puritans believed that the end of the world was approaching and that the kingdom of God was at hand, something they considered was inevitable. The Calvinists actually believed in predestination, that everything was ordained by the will of God, which could not be changed. Yes, but this conviction, it was a firm conviction, did not in any sense reduce their revolutionary fervor and their determination to bring about this new world as quickly as possible. On the contrary, it, this belief, it spurred them on to great feats of revolutionary bravery and audacity. And it's the same for us today. And we must approach the, the task of the socialist revolution with exactly the same spirit of revolutionary determination. The reason that I say these words is that some people say, oh, well, if you say that so is socialism, is socialism inevitable? I say, yes, it's historically inevitable. Well, in that case, why didn't we just sit down and wait for it to happen? <laughs> well, of course, it doesn't work like that. The capitalist system is dying on its feet. It reminds me of, of these monsters you remember in the old horror films, the, the B-movies, the horror films. Uh, it's, it's dead, yes, it's dead, but it refuses to die. It clings desperately to life. And by prolonging its, its life and in, in, in these circumstances, it is dooming millions of people to a horrible fate. Come as the capitalist system is not going to collapse under its own uh, the weight of its own contradictions. That's not going to happen. Lenin explained that there's no such thing as a final crisis of capitalism. 
existe nada que parece sea una um, crisis final del capitalismo. The capitalist system can emerge even from the deepest crisis. Oh yes. El sistema capitalista podrá emerger de las eh, crisis más profundas. Can it get out of the present crisis? Well, it could. Podría salir it could. de la crisis actual. If it is not overthrown, it can. Pues sí, podría. Si oh, yes. no derrotado, But that's not the point. That's not the point. Pero esa no es la uh, if it emerges from this crisis, si puede de esta crisis, what will the result be? Va a ser el I've already said what the result will be. He dicho va a ser el Decades of suffering, of austerity, of oppression, and so on and so forth. The economist some years ago put it rather well, I thought. It said, well, people want to return to normality. This was after the crisis of 2008. Yeah. People want desperately to return to normality. That's the case now, isn't it? People want to return to normality. That's actually the main the main base of support for reformism. That's why most people are not yet revolutionaries because they're still hoping hoping desperately for a return to what a return to normality. You have to understand the psychology of the masses. But the economists give a very good reply to that. He said, he said, yes, yeah, sooner or later we will return to normality. Yes. But it will be a new normality, it said, a new normality. A perspective, a terrible perspective of degeneration, decay, decline, death by starvation of millions of people, cuts, destruction of, destruction of the gains made by the working class. And even then, sooner or later, that will just provoke a new and even deeper slump, an even deeper depression. That's all. So what conclusion can we draw? The line of history now is entering into, it's a declining line. There can be this or that temporary recovery, that, that is, we must be prepared for that also. But, but a serious recovery, a serious economic upswing as the past is entirely ruled out. It's absolutely, absolutely ruled out. And therefore, we must draw the conclusions. If, uh, if you say A, you must say B, C and D. The task of this school is to explain the basic ideas of Marxism to the new generation in particular. I note with enormous pleasure and pride the fact that uh, over 6,000 people have uh, signed on for this school, which is a marvelous achievement from over a hundred countries. And I wish you all welcome, comrades. You're all our comrades and friends. You are the future. And we must use this school for what? To sharpen our weapons. The weapons which will ultimately destroy the capitalist system. What are these weapons at this moment in time? At this precise, precise moment, we're not talking about machine guns or hand grenades. We're not talking about, about that kind of weapon.
No, there's a more powerful weapon than that. The, the weapon of ideas. And Marx said that ideas become a material force when they grip the minds, the minds of the masses. How much we must utilize this school, every minute of it must be used to the full. To study in depth the marvelous ideas of the theoretical arsenal of Marxism in order to arm the new generation of fighters with the necessary weapons which are needed to guarantee the victory of the working class. That is all, the only way to put an end to the, this nightmare of capitalism. And prepare the birth of the new world, which will open up a new page, a glorious page in human civilization, utilizing all the marvelous machinery and technology that exists under capitalism. In a genuinely rational, democratic, and scientific uh, uh, system of, of economy. Which will abolish the evils of uh, unemployment, homelessness, exploitation and oppression of women and open up a new and glorious phase in the history of mankind. Comrades and friends, that is our task. That is the only thing that's worth fighting for and sacrificing for. In the 21st century. Comrades, forward to victory. Long live the working class. Workers of the world unite. Forward to communism.